Alright, so I thought I'd make a quick video on a subject which I feel may be of some interest. Um, and just in case someone wants to watch this as an ASMR, I'll sort of whisper it. Basically, it's on the subject of Hitler's true personality. I find this an interesting subject because, um, like a lot of historical um, time periods, people, etc., it's often very misrepresented. Um, I think there are understandable reasons behind it, but if you have historical interests and things like that, I feel it's probably desirable to try to understand one of the chief actors in one of the greatest wars that has occurred in recent human history. Um, yet, unfortunately, there is something of a stigma associated with reading some of the primary sources. Uh, hence, and perhaps because of people's busy schedules, it might be desirable I say a few remarks. Um, so I think, I, uh, I think I'll try to clarify a bit of uh, what Hitler's actual personality was like. Um, which, not surprisingly, is a little bit different from how his kind of Hollywood cartoonish uh, depiction is. Uh, for example, um, Charlie Chaplin in, I believe it's called The Great Dictator, really quite got the relationship between Hitler and Mussolini completely wrong. Um, Hitler actually quite respected Mussolini. He maybe didn't respect the Italians fully, but um, I'll get to that. So, starting off, I should probably first mention that here are some primary sources that you, well, some sources you may find useful. Firstly, there's Hitler's arguably or autobiography, and I avoid mentioning the exact name because that might trigger some people. I don't think it should. Uh, it's a historical document. In addition to that, there's also something which I think in English is known as Hitler's Table Talk. It's a very fascinating uh, document. It's a collection of various of various conversations he had with, um, I guess you'd say, his intimate circle uh, throughout some of the most contentious years of the war. Unfortunately, it doesn't uh, it doesn't run up to the very end of it. Uh, you don't get to hear his dying thoughts or anything like that. Although, to be honest, if you've read enough of his writings, his actual writings, uh, you can kind of figure it out, which is, I think, um, one of the useful things about studying these things. Because uh, there were a number of occasions where reading through this, I would be able to predict, uh, you know, like, I'd be like, ah, I see, and that's why he did that. You'd be able to predict from that moment how he was going to react in the future. And he did indeed do that, so you now understood why, which brings me up to the point of his coherency, and I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, beyond that, I suppose I'll, I'll add in that Guderian is also a useful source. Um, Manstein. Uh, I'm going to also reference Albert Einstein and uh, Trotsky, uh, additionally. I think I've I've mentioned most everyone that I, I feel would be most essential. Um, so anyway. <laughs> Hitler is often depicted as, well, mad, insane. And that's not a question of personality or personal values. Um, that's kind of a bit of a medical diagnosis. He was, in fact, not just like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, if you've read his manifesto, was, in fact, not. Uh, you could argue both individuals were somewhat sociopathic, but um, they were coherent. You may disagree with their, you know, values, and I may say on a number of points I do, but that's not to say that, you know, they were hysterical or anything like that, deluded madmen. No. Um, you remember how I mentioned that you could actually read in part of Hitler's diaries, you could, you could read something and it would, it would click with you immediately that, ah, 
this is why he did this or I remember he did put this in place later on the fact that you can kind of see him talking about how he would react to a crisis before it actually occurred years before it occurred kind of does destroy a bit the depiction of him succumbing to bouts of of hysteria or paranoia or anything like that no he stayed rather consistent having said that he was a human being like anyone else so he had his fits of emotion I'll try not to jump ahead of things. I think to begin with Hitler, we ought to begin at the beginning. And this is one of the really fascinating details that you don't get to uh, ever find out about if you don't believe in reading Hitler's autobiography. Again, it's not often called that, but I'm referring to it as that. Hitler's father was actually very much against people who were anti-Semitic. Of course, Hitler had a very negative uh, relationship with his father. Hitler's father, I believe it was Hitler's father originally, I don't think it was his grandfather, I think it was his father. And, and I'll state this um, firstly, just outright and directly. I could plaster up on screen all sorts of citations and um, screenshots of pages I'm referencing, and that would be very persuasive, yes, but. I'm not going to. I've referenced the sources. I've mentioned the sources you can read to uh, correlate, corroborate uh, what I'm what I'm saying. However, to be honest, as to my reasons, one, I just came off of <laughs> uh, doing a multiple month long effort with an ASMR, which involved me composing all this music, etc. So. Uh, there's that, and um, also I have a, my USMLE step exam is coming up, so understandably I don't want to be involving myself so much in a very long project, so I'm trying to keep things minimal. So I'll be breaking up the flow of my discussion a bit just because I'm paranoid about my camera and recording cutting off prematurely. Unfortunately that happens with some things. Anyway. Um, I believe it was his father who actually came from a poor village, I think. I think I recall the story. He was a highly driven man, and he went into the city because um, that's where basically a person went in order to achieve things. And I believe he was a very ambitious man and a very driven one, and he ultimately did wind up with a government position. I believe originally he had actually wanted to be a priest at first because that was the big respected man uh, when he was younger. I certainly do not think I'm describing Hitler here. That would be embarrassing if I was. <laughs> but anyway, um, what happened was, you know, he ultimately found out that wasn't, it, it, and in his village that was the most respected position, but he ultimately essentially found out that, you know, it wasn't ultimately in the world at large, so he kind of changed his ambitions to being a, a government official, which was highly respected at the time, a member of the bureaucracy, and he did indeed achieve that. I don't think his post was precisely grand, but it was a very respectable one. Um... And forgive me if I'm kind of summarizing things and jumping over here and there. Hitler's father is not the main point. I'm trying to establish where he came from. Hitler's father was a very strict individual, and Hitler was not at all fond of him. It did not help that both of them were very strong-willed individuals. You see, I'm starting to paint the portrait of how Hitler was. You see why I'm doing this. Very stereotypically... Hitler and his father fought over Hitler wanting to do art, to be an artist. Hitler's father had kind of climbed the world a bit, and naturally he wanted to pass on that privilege to his son. Hitler made a very painful and stupid mistake. So, he basically, more or less, and again I'm summarizing things, he threatened to drop out of school 
if his father didn't let him become an artist. Now they would get into yelling fights over all of this. And the fact of the matter was, I have to say, Hitler's father wasn't too bright in how he handled this because his strong was his his son was strong willed. Forgive me, it's almost like three in the morning, maybe it is right now. <laughs> anyway, his uh his son was very strong willed, and of course when Hitler's father told him he couldn't do something and was strict with him and yelled and all the rest of that, he just dug in harder. This proved true of Hitler throughout his life. <laughs> so, Hitler eventually does essentially drop out of school. This is important for a reason. A reason. So, Hitler wasn't German in a certain respect. He was actually Austrian, but regardless... Um, in the whole educational milieu he was a uh, part of at the time, you couldn't become an architect unless you had gotten your degree, graduated from the earlier schools. Hitler had unfortunately dropped out of that school, and so he didn't really have the option to proceed. You see, Hitler had been actually a very good artist from where he came from. And in fact, some of his paintings and sketchings, etc., do show some merit. Um, people tend to denounce them just because it's Hitler who made them. I think that's a little bit unfair. Um, so, you do sort of see something which his, uh, his reviewers pointed out. Hitler excelled at charring buildings. He was very good in all that detail. So, he had been a good artist, period, though, and he was, like, the best at drawing in his school or something like that, and in his a his area, his region. Uh, but when he got to, you know, the big city, so to speak, the judges were rather less than kind with him, and uh, they they basically dismissed him outright from ever you know, from even considering ever entering into the big, formal, you know, prestigious art school. This, of course, was quite devastating to Hitler, but he kind of internalized very strongly what someone, one of the judges said to him, basically, or their decision, if you will, uh, whether or not you want to say, say to him, whatever. He basically said that this person, you know, he was horrible with drawing faces, again, a bit of a harsh judgment. He was horrible with drawing people, but he was very good at drawing buildings, and in fact, the person believed, I, I think if I recall correctly, more or less assumed he had some architectural association or something like that, and that he was well suited to being an architect. Because that also, you know, involved drawing and all that. In fact, um, Hitler actually did go around and draw a lot of the buildings of the big city. It seemed to be something he was naturally drawn to. But I'm not trying to tell necessarily the story of his life. Um, I'm trying to get at his character. He was clearly able to internalize, uh, you know, external criticism. Um, perhaps because it suggested a destiny or a path forward to him, and I think that was part of the point. It actually gave him a purpose in life. This is very important. A lot of his experiences are very important to policies he later put into effect. Hitler was actually, surprisingly, rather meritocratic. At least this is his stated intention. And one of the reasons for this is because he was denied a chance, a chance just based upon the fact that he didn't have a degree from an earlier school. I don't know if at the time there was the ability to take a test Maybe he could have, um, <laughs> to just get that degree, but evidently it was either impractical or he didn't know of it, so I don't know if there was an equivalency exam. But, um, Hitler, you know, I think he had more or less a roommate or something. He would sometimes argue with that man who was, seemed fairly level-tempered. Uh, the guy actually wrote a book, which hopefully is still extant, about essentially my time with Hitler or my time with young Hitler. So he described some of his personality there, and according to him, um, he was kind of given to making grand speeches, kind of, and, you know, taking up big projects and then dropping them a few days later. 
kind of not too surprising a character sketch for someone who a would enter into politics for the first part and b someone who was creative hitler was indeed creative and his inventions weren't all insane in fact the ironically named mouse tank uh, you get to even find out his reasons behind that when you read of um, his table talk yes i think it's in his table talk basically for that i mean hitler didn't always get all of his details right if that was true then he was hardly the only one after all military doctrine was something in flux in those days and there were plenty of people i mean the famous thing that guderian you can quote is essentially that the car or the motor or whatever basically mechanized transportation will never have any other purpose than simply hauling around a uh, flour <laughs> obviously proved incorrect tanks proved very important um but anyway Hitler actually believed that essentially the tank didn't need to be quick, that what it was really meant for was more or less dueling other tanks and, you know, essentially fighting. Because what he pointed out was is that it's infantry that really wins battles or holds ground or whatever, and from their experiences, I think, for example, in France as well, he had observed that... Um, they could easily outrun their supplies and other things like that. So in his opinion, mobility wasn't necessarily that important, which is kind of ironic because, as I recall, one of the few advantages that Hitler's tanks actually had against the French tanks was they were quicker. Um, I mean, I also think they had radios and other things like that, and you can criticize the... and Guderian certainly does. I think it's Guderian and not Manstein. The French were basically essentially stifling all the initiatives of their subordinates. Um, they were kind of afraid of initiative, whereas the Germans allowed it. Ironic, they were much freer. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'll return to the subject of Hitler and his father and what he did with school. Um... Hitler was close with his mother, but not so much his father, and his assessment of her was essentially that she wouldn't have necessarily passed well with the aristocratic circles. Neither would Hitler, of course, but that was because he didn't want to. Hitler, in fact, was offered, shortly upon coming to power, the ability to become a duke if he had wanted to. <laughs> Crazy. All sorts of stories you miss if you don't read into the documents of history, right? You see, if he had allowed the royalists to come to power, you know, they were essentially embarrassed to be associated with him, but if he had restored the monarchy, they were willing to nonetheless allow him to become a duke. You know, he wouldn't be part of any inner circles or anything, but he'd have a nice fancy title. Um, <laughs> Hitler regarded that as ridiculous. Quite correctly. Um, so anyway, basically he said of his mother that, you know, she wouldn't have really passed in the aristocratic circles, but she gave Germany a son, you know. So, Hitler was actually very fond of his mother, and this is where I'm going to enter into something. I feel there's a danger in what often happens. It's called, I think the psychological concept is splitting. All good or all bad. Um, whereas in reality, human beings are usually a mixture of both. And the danger in engaging in that is, is that when you learn anything good about someone, you can basically have the feeling that, well, maybe they're actually completely good, or maybe they're not really bad at all. Whereas on the other hand, if you accept that people are complex individuals, there's less of a danger of that happening. So having said that, Hitler did have some good traits. He cared about his mother, and it's very touching, in fact. In fact, he was even willing to find it touching when, you know, he noted one of his comrades cared for his mother, you know, like, you know, took care of her and all that, and it was very touching. Even though he was a humble person, he... Hitler still noticed the fact, you know, uh, one of his comrades, how well he took care of his mother. Hitler's comrades is a very interesting subject. I'll get into that as well, hopefully. I have a lot of things to mention. So he cared for his mother, and that's one of the reasons why he never told her about being rejected from the academy. Mm. 
So he kind of explained as much to his friend and he understood. Um, he didn't want his mother to worry. That's rather touching. Also, I think she developed cancer, unfortunately. The doctor who treated her was Jewish. And Hitler did not demonize this doctor. He was sincerely grateful to him, and I believe even during the whole Nazi oppression period, he actually made sure that that Jewish doctor was protected. So, it goes to show you he wasn't entirely bad or entirely insane. Evidently, he did recognize some exceptions, and he did have personal gratitude. Uh, I remember... Goering, I think, actually personally interested to protect a, um, a Jewish fellow fighter pilot, I think. You know, they had served together or something. So these people did make exceptions to people they knew from time to time. The issue of cosmopolitanism and, you know, judging people by their individual traits actually did come up in a conversation. Um... I suppose I, I want to mention that rather than leaving until later. Fascinatingly enough, the whole idea that you should judge people by their individual merits indirectly kind of did come up in one of Hitler's conversations, and it was evidently so offensive to the person taking notes that they kind of wrote in. I, I think I recall they wrote in something to the effect of this obviously incorrect opinion or something like that. <laughs> A little departure from objectivity. Objectivity. But one of Hitler's personal companions basically uh, had brought up the theory that basically phrased in racial sort of things that would be acceptable to Hitler and Nazism, etc. That, you know, perhaps people have trace amounts of Germanic, Nordic blood or whatever Aryan blood. And so you can see the superior blood sometimes manifesting to the surface, like with these Slavs, etc. Some of them, you know, essentially more or less being good people. And something to the effect of that, you know, sort of preserving them with the interest of the good ones, you know, I don't know, passing on their traits or something, you know, them being good by virtue of having Aryan blood, because that's one of the things uh, people, uh, another one of the things that's commonly gone wrong, people like to think things like, you know, Hitler looked down upon the Italians, well, in short, he kind of did. He didn't view them as basically being too effective, and that's not necessarily entirely untrue, because Italy at the time was not nearly as mechanized or industrialized as Germany was, so flat out, it's not surprising they didn't perform as well. If for only that reason, if for only that reason, though I think there probably are other... Though I think you could also mention other ones. But he had a kind of workaround. He basically not inaccurately, kind of said that the North Italians were Germanic. I mean, Lombards, right? And uh, the idea is, is that he had some interesting archaeological observations. Hitler was a fairly educated man. In fact, he yells this once at Manstein that he had read all these various different military books. That is something Hitler did a lot. He read a lot, and that's a commend commendable trait. I don't know if he necessarily understood everything, but and it's kind of funny to see how wacky some of the theories were. Um, not too wacky, though. Like, one of the uh, astrological theories that he brings up, I think, multiple times, is, is that the moon was formed by a crater, sorry, by an asteroid hitting the Earth and causing a large amount of rock to uh, break off or something. So it's, it's kind of interesting to hear about the state of science at those times. And also the nature of scientific observations. They were... Um, a little less precise with their measurements back in those days. Um, so anyway, Hitler didn't view the Italians as intrinsically inferior. In fact, he, he viewed Il Duce uh, from the perspective of basically the Roman Empire. And he also believed that he kind of attributed to the Greeks and to the Italians basically their classical glory to essentially the Germans having migrated into those areas. Now, how did he feel about the Japanese? That's a very interesting question, because he actually kind of flip-flops a bit on that. At certain time periods, he's basically full of praise of them, mainly the militarist among them, as basically, you know, I, I don't know, saving, you know, Japan from the degenerate element, you know, more or less showing Aryan traits. I don't think he 
quite ever hints at like them having any Aryan blood. However, he's not always entirely positive with them. He basically kind of more or less says, not with entire, but an entire degree of inaccuracy, since Japan is famous for having absorbed, even while adding plenty of its own elements, it's famous for having absorbed Chinese culture and then later on, in, you know, absorbed Western culture, particularly Britain with some things. I think for America, it was education. They took America, uh, American education models. They took some stuff from France as well, but a lot of stuff they copied was British, essentially. So Hitler's take on all that was essentially that the good traits the Japanese had were things that essentially they had just absorbed by, I don't know, osmosis or whatever from uh, the Europeans. And if the Europeans were to vanish, like, I don't know, in six months or something, or over time, the Japanese would lose all of those good traits. So he kind of, he, he vacillates, well, I won't say vacillates, he can sometimes show very different perspectives on people's Hitler, for example, while indirectly praising Britain for um, having run their colonies fairly well, in his perspective, way too humanely, and he also hated the tendencies of the Germans to basically go as missionaries and actually try to, you know, educate the natives. Um, while he kind of indirectly praises them for that, he also kind of throws out some ridiculous stuff, like, for example, that the British just put an end to the whole widow-burning practice because they <laughs> wanted to conserve wood. It's kind of ridiculous, but it's humorous. Anyway, um... His viewpoint on the British was sometimes positive, but as he was fighting against them, ultimately it was often negative, and he viewed them as essentially people being warmongers. <laughs> Funny about that, he actually viewed the other side as being the one that was starting the war, or if not starting, basically furthering war continually, um, trying to instigate it on the continent, etc. Um, but he did have some positive things to say about the British when he was contrasting them with the Americans. He reserves a lot of bile for America. He essentially says things to the effect that, uh, basically he only admired us Americans for our ability to mass produce things, uh, cheaply and produce a lot of them. <laughs> I don't know if he attributed too much engineering skill uh, to the country, uh, but he viewed it as, I'm going to avoid any trigger words here, he viewed the, con the whole continent as rather overwhelmed by or dominated by Jewish and black influences. Now, relative to his country, maybe that was true, and I only say relative to his country, and also he might have been referencing the obviously famous preponderance of Jewish influence in Western banks. Um, I don't know if he was referencing at any time the Hollywood entertainment industry, but this brings up something very quickly, I will say, which is rather interesting and was said by a Jew himself, um, Trotsky. Well, I must make sure this goes, I must make sure this doesn't go on too long, though if you want to see some further videos of the subject, feel free to ask me for it. Um, but one of the important things to understand about anti-Semitism in um, Eastern and Central Europe is um, some of the social and economic conditions. Uh, for one thing, when people criticize the Eastern European countries for going over to Hitler, you really have to understand they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. In fact, some of them were hoping for Western aid, which was not forthcoming. So that was a decisive factor, and Hitler was obviously willing to bully some of them, in fact, more or less staging coups or takeovers of their country. And also, when you have to choose between Hitler and Stalin, understandably at the time that didn't feel like too much of a desirable choice. People hated Bolsheviks for pretty good reasons. But as I was saying, Albert Einstein and, um, and Trotsky, both Jews, both remarked upon, you know, wrote about the situation. Um, I will quote, I will reference Trotsky here most. 
Basically, he went over some labor statistics, and not surprisingly, as is the case for most groups, particularly in this time period, the average Jew in Eastern Europe. I'm trying to think, maybe he was specifically referencing Romania. The average Jew was a, a day laborer, a laborer, laboring class worker. Yeah. However, having said that, there was basically a very high preponderance of Jews in certain, in, in certain industries, such as banking. Of course, there are historical reasons behind that, but I will say in passing that, literally speaking, at least in the medieval era, when I'm thinking of a particular set of statistics, the church had set the usury late rate at a certain percentage. I could quote it, but I'm sure it changed over time, if I recall my um, Wealth of Nations. The Knights, poor Knights of St. John, the Knight the Knights Templar, they they said their interest rate at like half of, of that, and they're an interesting story too. They were like the first international bankers. <laughs> uh, no, they were not Jewish. No, they were Christian. Um, they said it at like half that rate. The Jews, literally, as their rate was higher than that, which was set as the max by the church, actually practiced usury, so they were literally usurers. I'm assuming they probably took on more risk for a variety of reasons. Um, another thing that's interesting is there were some there were some areas in I, I'm thinking of a particular place in Italy, for example, where certain lords would cash in on the Jewish um, populations by offering them protection, you know, which is a valuable enough thing in a hostile world. Uh, but they'd make them pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. One of the kings, and I'm well, one of the leading political figures in Eastern Europe, and I'm trying to remember whether it was Romania or, or I don't think it was Hungary. Uh, he was actually a person which had some admirable traits. Now, some of the leaders actually tried to preserve their Jewish population, keep them from being exterminated. Why did Hitler want to exterminate uh, these populations, or why did the SS, was it, want to do so? Because, ironic, well, not ironically, um, I don't want any unfavorable comparisons to be made, but like the post office, this was one of those services that actually run its, ran itself out of profit, so there was an economic incentive to go and, you know, liquidate populations, take out gold teeth, things like that. Um, it wasn't just that either. It provided German industry with very cheap labor to have um, labor that you were essentially, you know, willing to work to death. But it wasn't only that either. Um, supply shortages caused by Allied bombings often, you know, con contributed to a worsening, obviously, of prisoner situations, much like in the case of Union soldiers held by the Confederacy. The other side does blame, have some part of the blame for some of the poor living, uh, living conditions. No, I am not comparing the Confederacy to, you know, Hitler or the concentration camps. I'm just bringing that up as an extra detail. Obviously, when the country is having to just barely scrape by, uh, they often don't feel like diverting a lot of their wartime funds or resources to their prisoner population. Uh, anyway, some of the Eastern Europeaners actually, you know, the leaders tried to save some of their Jewish population and succeeded. For example, one excuse I remember is essentially claiming that they were needed for infrastructure projects. Um, but there was one particular Eastern European leader who basically... He went and beat up, I think, some communists, either that or was fascist, who had... Um, broken in more or less and were demonstrating in like a, an opera house he an old man went and actually floored like three of them he was really impressive and he basically was screaming at them calling them traitors to their country so from him i take a particular quote to the effect that it was very frustrating when you're trying to actually build up a nation to see that all of it was in the hands of another people like all the productive resources the factories the banks etc that was kind of their perspective. There was a debate even indulged in by Trotsky over whether or not Jews consisted, were like a nation within multiple nations, like whether they were part of the nation itself or whether they were a nation that was scattered among many different nations. 
a little less relevant nowadays, kind of, because there is a Jewish state now. I'm not going to get into all of that just because this is a complex subject to go and meander into. I'm trying to say, to come to my conclusion of this point, you have to understand that the Eastern European countries were in a difficult area and a lot of people genuinely did believe in the fight against Bolshevikism for good reasons. Uh, Hitler was not merely being cynically exploitative. I'm going to try to jump back to my point about uh, his school days and hopefully be a little quicker. <laughs> Hitler was constantly in conflict with the priests. Anyone who tries to depict Hitlerism or, you know, the rise of fascism as is this right, alt-right, no, <laughs> anyway, as is ultra-right wing, you know, maybe conservative, maybe even religious movement, it wasn't. Just because the areas that were Protestant voted for um, Hitler, they like to sometimes point that out, Catholics. Um, there's a reason why all this happened. There was essentially a Catholic League, and the Catholics voted for the Catholic League, more or less. The cities voted socialist slash communist, more or less. And the other areas left over voted for Hitler at a time period where clearly, essentially, the democracy they had had wasn't really working, and a lot of people viewed it with some skepticism. So, do I respect the decision? Not quite. Um, there's a lot of politics going on behind the scene. Um, the military dictator, they, the military dictator, military dictator they had. That's a bit unfair. He was a war hero for some reason, which escapes me. But he was associated with the war effort and, um, you know, World War One, And he ran the place, I think, Germany, with, you know, kind of more or less as a dictator because he had to. He made use of constitutional devices to do so. And it probably, although some people would criticize that loophole, I think it probably did preserve some degree of stability. Very important detail. You know how Hitler is basically talked up for getting rid of the, you know, horrible, like, reparations in Versailles Treaty? Much of that had actually been dealt with. Um, a previous minister from the previous government had actually succeeded in getting much of this reduced and a very reasonable payment schedule made that would have actually had the whole stuff paid off by 1980 or so. Yeah, lots of time for it. Very reasonable, in fact. I think quite wise, because there were some people who had noted that the horrible treaty uh, conditions were going to probably lead to another world war, and they were correct about it. But there's something very important also I want to mention. The socialists uh, were very powerful in Germany at the time, and one of the nonviolent devices they used for resistance proved uh, quite catastrophic. They essentially had... Um, okay, this is complicated. Basically, Germany wasn't able to pay, so France ended up taking over their industrial region, one of them, and occupying it, and the Germans were essentially told to strike. So the French kind of did bring in, like, French workers, but basically... The government had to pay those people to strike, you know, because it was months of it, and it led to hyperinflation. That really worsened the situation in Germany. That's an important detail for that whole time period. Um, but Hitler in Hitler in his youth was not fond of priests, and he remained so throughout the entirety of his life. He was, however, a spiritual person. He spoke often of, you know, spiritual things. I mean, he he thought of himself as being spiritual, and he thought it was natural for men, for human beings to be spiritual. His great atheistic de device, I'm an atheist myself, just incidentally, but um, his great atheistic device was he was going to build observatories in, like, I don't know... Uh, I don't know if I'd quite say every remote village, but basically accessible to everyone so they could go and look up into the heavens and essentially they wouldn't fear gods and it would put them in their place, you know, natural order of things, they'd see things and essentially this was supposed to get rid of the whole god thing. The thing which is kind of interesting is a lot of uh, Hitler's observation on religion and some of the various 
politicking, I guess, that went on behind the scene. It's pretty damn interesting. For one, Hitler astutely realized uh, Germany was paying a lot of money towards the the church at the time. They, they paid, like, basically a tithe to them, and he thought this was a freaking waste. Maybe. Uh... So he basically, his idea to get them to go along with it was is that he'd go and give them, like, the high-level people a large sum, but much less than they were giving to the church, and he'd let them distribute it as they wish, and he knew damn well that they were going to pocket most of the money, because that's the sort of people they were. In fact, he actually was, I think, tapping some conversation or something, or he intercepted some conversation, I think, between various members of the clergy... I think some had come from England, for example, where they were talking in quite disgusting language, and uh, <laughs> he went and called them on it, and it's just kind of interesting to see what went on behind the scenes with the church, um, the religious element uh, in both France and and Germany formed one of the chief resistance groups against Nazis, and they were punished for it, of course. That's one of the things you have to appreciate about why do people vote Nazi. Well, it's not like Hitler was very nice about allowing dissenting opinions. Having said that, Hitler isn't quite as arbitrary and cruel as people make him out to be. I'm going to reference some of his childhood incidents just to further develop his character and personality. My camera battery is starting to go a bit. <laughs> I am sorry for all the verbosity, but this is a very interesting subject, isn't it? Hitler often fought with the um, with the priests in his school. He was he was sent off to essentially boarding school. I'm not going to get into the details, but he often was fighting with them, and you know I guess he was a free thinker. Uh, he hated religion. The priests were very strict, and so were the nuns, um, who, you know, were in their counterpart school, I guess. That's probably an important detail about the strictness of his environment. So there was a famous, almost, catch line that, you know, a, a priest would say to him, or his teachers in general, Hitler, sit down. Because <laughs> he was always... He was always catching them in contradictions and things like that. Hitler was a fairly intelligent person, and he, even in the strict environment, he was able to stand up and argue against the priest. Um, there was a law, for example, which he disagreed with, I, I think probably because he just got swept up in, like, you know, a movement in some meetings and such. It was essentially, you know, allowing divorce because that was illegal at the time. So he went and, you know, there was this meeting with women and a bunch of guys, probably guys who wanted to get with married women. <laughs> who uh, were talking about, like, all the monstrosities women had to suffer through, etc., you know, horrible, boorish husbands. Um, maybe that's true. Uh, it may be they were just sexually bored, and so they were painting their husbands in unflattering uh, terms. Divorce is an unpleasant but interesting subject, as they've had various workarounds, even in situations where divorce is not allowed, like... I think I've read something about, like, auctions being more or less held to trade property, so to speak. But I won't, into, I won't get into that. So, he actually would go and argue in favor of divorce with the priest, for example. Uh, yeah. So you can take that, that he was a rather brave individual, and he probably had strong opinions. Trotsky has certain similarities in that. He was, you know, also standing up for justice in his... I think he went to a religious school as well. So he'd stick up for, basically, people and things like that. Didn't stop Trotsky from being involved in mass murder, and didn't stop Hitler, but, you know, they did have some sense of justice, at least at that time period in their life. There is a simply wonderful incident regarding young Hitler I have to mention to you. It does sort of show some of his personality well. So Hitler really only got badly drunk once in his life. And this was a man who kind of lived, forgive the flattering depiction, as a, a flattering depiction as a bit of a rock star when he was in the period of struggle. I mean, he was like going from house to house and things like that, avoiding the police, going off into far-flung locations, basically, like a bit of a rock star or a bit of a spy. A rock star, perhaps, with, with you know him being involved in very popular meetings. There is a wonderful story 
involving him overhearing, you know, going incognito and overhearing being at the table, people demonizing him. And then they, he actually saw them at a rally very shortly thereafter because I guess they were curious and they had these incredible looks on their face to realize that they had actually been in the presence of Hitler the whole time. <laughs> um, but anyway, he didn't punish them or anything like that. Hitler wasn't always as tyrannical as people depict him to be. Actually, the jailer, well, firstly, commendable to him, he ended up converting much of the prison he was held in. <laughs> yeah. He was so afraid of being put back in prison on a mere technicality that he basically never drove himself after. He knew how to drive, but he never drove himself after being released from prison because he was just being that careful about it. He didn't want them to put him back in prison on a pretext. Hmm. Interesting detail, but he basically converted the entirety of the prison to, uh, to his fascism. This may be relevant to the next point. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It may decrease the magnanimity of it a bit if the person was a fascist. But um, his former jailhouse leader, the person who had been essentially his captor in a way, was actually allowed or put into whatever a high-ranking government position. And Hitler commented, only in Germany is such a thing possible. Um, Hitler was aware uh, that his country had some rather merciful traditions, which he disagreed with in a number of points. Um, but if you view Germany as necessarily very rigid, Manstein was not of that opinion. He, I think it was Manstein. I don't know if it was Guderian. He was basically saying something to the effect of that, you know, we like freedom since, like, our wandering days. You know, the migration into Western Europe, etc. You know, we like a challenge, things like that. You know, that we're not very rigid and orderly. And Hitler observed various cases that were quote unquote merciful. So one case is obviously merciful. If you, if you, if if a person could prove he just stole the bread that he needed to survive that day, and you know nothing else, he wouldn't even be prosecuted. Like as a matter of law, they let him go. Also, abortion was an issue back then. I mean, it still is now, but it was a kind of legal thing. So if someone actually killed a woman just because he was afraid of the unborn child. He was let off. Like he could push her into a river or something like that. Kind of a little crazy, but whatever. Hitler actually had to fight against um, his judges uh, because they were constantly trying to resist him. Which brings up a point. So you know how people depict basically, like it's basically death to oppose Hitler? No, not actually. His uh, judges and various other people were often opposing him, maybe only for petty bureaucratic reasons, for their own, you know, power or whatever, but his word was not quite actually absolute, and he even had to get someone to act as a notary for him for petty matters, which he found ridiculous, I agree. So he was still bound by basically just the issue of politics and that, you know, he could convey an order and people wouldn't necessarily carry it out. Him and Guderian got into screaming matches and both Guderian and Manstein depict themselves as the one general that would actually stand up to him. Well, interesting detail. If they got into screaming matches, which were so bad that people actually had to close the windows and doors or something because people outside could hear them, kind of proves he doesn't execute people quite on a whim, correct? Yeah, interesting detail to note. People could actually talk back to Hitler, at least the high-ranking ones, and they didn't necessarily get shot or killed. Um, so anyway, he only really got really drunk once, I think, more or less, and uh, that was upon graduation, because he graduated from some place, <laughs> just not the place he had to. So he went and got smashed drunk um, with a group of his friends. I think it was basically their idea. He woke up, passed out in the middle of a field somewhere, like some peasant woman had woken him up. He had, he had like gone blackout drunk. And to his shame, he could not find his diploma anywhere. He was horrified. That was obviously a very bad thing. That was a big problem. So very meekishly, he went to the principal, 
and you know he walked all the way there back to the school <laughs> and the principal produced a piece of paper or rather a number of pieces of paper covered with some brown stuff it was his diploma he had been so drunk he had mistaken it for toilet paper and had used it to wipe his ass <laughs> after defecating <laughs> He was, needless to say, a little bit embarrassed, but he evidently took it rather than... I think he took it rather than getting a, a, a new diploma made for him. Yeah, I, I think he took it rather than getting a new diploma made for him. <laughs> I imagine he cleaned it up or something, but it's a very hilarious true story involving young Hitler. Here's another interesting thing. Remember how I told you that Hitler, uh, Hitler's father hated anti-Semites? Hitler also hated anti-Semites in the beginning. But he went to, you know, Vienna. He went to Vienna, and it was a very psychologically damaging experiencing for, experience for him. It was the big city. It was... Well, they had a bit of an anti-Semitic mayor, but to his... And Vienna was like the heart of the empire. It was really important. Culturally, everything was just massed into it. It was basically like their Athens. It kind of intentionally sucked everything into it. Um for better or for worse. But basically, there was an anti-Semitic mayor who I think Hitler did credit with basically, you know, striving against the fall of the empire, or at least of Vienna's importance, and like creating a bit of a renaissance. But there was a heavy prevalence of the Jewish element in, in there. And Hitler kind of got very, uh, not to mention, and I, I mean, I really should, there were the socialists as well, and that's also important in Germany. Um, they were very violent. They were very violent and very aggressive, and that's an interesting point to note about the environment Hitler entered into. But if you need to ask why is it that Hitler, or how could anyone basically hate the Jews, basically it's this. You know how we talk about big business? take out big business and put in Jews and that's essentially it they talked exactly the same way about Jews as we talk about big business I would humbly point out though that if if there was indeed as it seems there was a lot of manipulation of markets and artwork vi uh, values basically he pointed out an interesting bit of evidence that essentially the Jewish press or these Jewish art collectors would all engage in a lot of very nasty talk about artwork various pieces they would try to collapse a price and then I, oddly enough they would go and buy this painting they had been talking down <laughs> and they would gather it for their own collection basically this is kind of an obvious example of manipulating the markets uh, speculation and all that. I mean, it is how things work, but basically the point was uh, Hitler wasn't quite responding to nothing. He was responding to the economic situation present at the time. Um, the, the city was a very damaging thing to Hitler, and um, a lot of his political opinions got formed there, and a lot of the things he reacted to, he was kind of semi-grateful for his quote-unquote poverty. Now, some people will point out that... Um, he wasn't quite that poor. He does well. He kind of was, but he doesn't mention too much about. He doesn't focus as much on the whole orphan stipend thing and all this other stuff. He does, I think, mention it, but he kind of upplays his poverty a bit. But he observed a lot of things which were very influential to him when he saw all the poverty. If I recall correctly, also he had a horrible smoking habit at one point. But he realized that essentially that if he gave up smoking, he could actually have some butter on his bread. <laughs> or he could basically eat a little bit more. And that was a concern for him, so that kind of does indicate he was living in something of a situation of poverty. So he made a rather logical decision and gave up the smoking. He gave up something, and I do believe it was smoking. He, he, he never really drank. I mean, I'm a teetotaler. I don't know if, if Hitler was. Uh, he never really drank after that blackout drunken incident I mentioned. Uh, he certainly never drunk to that level. 
but you know he gave up smoking with uh with basically the issue of having to eat and it was costing him a lot of money even back then and um one other thing i'll mention is the subject of meat i'm a vegetarian so was hitler he would bring up some point frequently that he used to suffer from horrible thirst but basically what happened was is that as soon as he or soon after becoming a vegetarian he no longer suffered from thirst anymore he didn't have to drink constantly or anything like that kind of interesting another uh, issue of hitler's health is um you know some some great leaders have suffered from digestive issues from time to time alfred the great obviously um trotsky too uh I'm, I'm not sure if i quite remember what his condition was either it was urgency or ir irritable bowel, bowel or something trotsky also had an issue hitler suffered from fistulas at one point in his life um this may for example suggest ibd like i don't know crohn's disease or something like that he actually thought he was going to die at one point from it because quote unquote he thought it was much more serious fistulas than they actually are i'm not going to get into the medical explanation of what fistulas are i have enough cra of that crap no pun intended i have enough of that crap uh, <laughs> you know during the day when i'm studying for the usmle but basically um he he thought it was much more serious than it actually was to quote him and so he made up a will so he might have suffered from some digestive issues himself uh he developed them not congenital ones anyway i could mention about various observations of him but um, I think I've dwelt upon his school long enough, and I've dwelt upon his time in the city somewhat. Basically, he came out of Vienna anti-Semitic. Um, in Berlin, perhaps it was he developed his intense hatred of socialism. Or at least German socialism slash communism. And not without reason. I'm going to get into that, and then hopefully I'll conclude this very long recording. Very long, but very interesting. I have so much I could talk about, but I'm going to kind of cut things off. My throat is getting rather pained. Uh, I'll mention a few high-yield topics. <laughs> I have to make sure my battery hasn't cut off. Oh my, I seem to be down to one bar. I really ought to wrap this up then. So basically, a few important things. High-yield, as they'll say. Um, Hitler did not openly admit to uh, having any mass extermination plan. Uh, in fact, what basically, he kind of said it was useful that people depicted it as that because, you know, helps instill some fear. But in, at least to his inner circle, for example, he more or less denied it. Maybe he was ignorant of it, but I highly doubt that. Um, his, his actual depiction, he does seem to have mentioned concentration ta camps in connection with killing people so he kind of knew something like that went on obviously you can infer that two things i will cite he actually said about the jews that essentially either like they get out of the country or if they refuse to then you know they go into concentration camps essentially he offered them an alternative that's a bit of a naive appreciation this was the great depression people weren't necessarily taking in huge masses of people at least voluntarily so they didn't necessarily have a place to go point two a large number of people fled germany upon the election of hitler if you actually think he was like he mesmerized the crowds well kind of but not really there were plenty of people who disliked him but they were kind of afraid to say anything in fact the air traffic control people it was heavily dominated by the jewish it was one of those industries i guess and it's it's rather hilarious they would allow hitler to fly during weather that was so horrible that basically it would kill a normal person and hitler was well aware of this that they were essentially hoping he was going to die um however he had a a pilot uh, you know with him who was a real rock star and like could even like land in the dark he was like well, like this is the days before they had all these impressive things to assist them. He basically would, he, would, he landed in open fields in the dark, you know, like, he pulled off a lot of things which essentially very much impressed Hitler. 
Hitler was a man, I will incidentally add, of a number of creative solutions. He basically also, in, he like installed a, um, a searchlight, you know, these big like industrial grade thing, you know, like something you'd use for planes or something on the back of his car so that if anyone tried to assassinate him, he could flip a switch and he would blind the person. Very clever. Um, let's see. So... Hitler didn't really necessarily propose to openly to kill off the Slavs or anything like that. He actually was essentially going to have them more or less pushed out into the hinterlands in German cities established a la the Roman model basically of, you know, putting soldiers in place to colonize a new area. And he wasn't going to really teach them to read anything more than road signs, and he didn't really feel there was any need to vaccinate them or anything like that. By the way, a naive perspective that would have been breeding grounds to kill off, you know, to build contagions that would kill off the German settlers eventually. But he didn't want anything, any sort of contact, anything to do with them. However, he was equitable enough to say that essentially if one of them, like, insists that they need, like, they have a toothache and they need to see a dentist, by all means let them see a dentist. So, he wasn't necessarily horrible, he wasn't great, he didn't actually quite openly enter into Eastern Europe with the plan of exterminating all of them. Then again, with Plan East, Plan Ost or something it's called, and his intentions weren't entirely friendly, we'll say that. I mean, that's evidence of that. Um, so let's see, what else? Basically, um, he was actually, the slaughter that took place when he had almost been assassinated was quite a premeditated one. He had put all of his opponents in either concentration camps or having them watched, and this was as per his idea that basically if you kill off all of the elements of potential resistance, you won't actually, you know, all the cores that it could organize around, you won't have to deal with rebellions, basically. This was not him uh, descending into paranoia or anything like that. This was him putting into effect something he had, a policy he had and had planned from years back. So all these people he had let live, all these people he had nicely let live and, you know, patted himself on the shoulder for doing, he then proceeded to kill them off at a moment he viewed as critical. Also, Hitler wasn't quite a backstabber <laughs> you know, with regards to Russia. I believe this is fairly well known by a lot of people at this point, but Russia was massing a lot of troops on the border. They were probably going to invade Romania. Why was Romania important? Because it was essentially the Middle East at the time. A lot of oil had been discovered, and a lot of oil in the Middle East hadn't been accessed yet, so it was actually a fairly important source of oil. So Hitler basically hated that his generals didn't appreciate the fact that wars were waged economically, so he needed to protect those Romanian oil fields, because that's where he got his, all his oil from. They did invest in various technologies to extract oil and all sorts of things like that, but at the end of the day, it was cheaper and quicker to get it from Romania, and, you know, it was necessary. I think that's most of the things, except I want to say one other thing, and this is nice about Hitler. He, he was kind towards animals. At the very least, he, he cared very much about his dogs, and he had a, a dog in the trenches with him in World War I, which was basically essentially a little celebrity, and I think everyone loved, and it was always waiting for him when he got back from a mission. Um, unfortunately, some bastard stole it from him. He had offered him a huge price, but as a matter of principle, Hitler refused to ever sell his dogs. And I'll say this about Hitler, he at least was, he, he was at least someone who would appreciate loyalty in other people, and sometimes showed it himself. Uh, I mean, he, he included, like, his comrades that had died in a dedication to his book. His comrades, I want to mention, often came from, basically, a particular social class and includes waiters, things like that, basically people who do odd jobs, etc. So they did their jobs during the day and they went off and were fanatical Hitler supporters at night, <laughs> you know. Hitler was, uh, uh, right, so as I was saying, Hitler was actually rather kind towards animals and he had genuine affection towards his dog, his dogs. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, that and his concern for his mother are two things I'd say that are nice about him. Does that excuse the rest? No, not really. So, I I'm sorry I'm rushing here, but I have limited battery <laughs> space uh, remaining. Little uh, limited battery remaining. Why did he kill off so many people? Basically because he was a person who had the perspective of ripping a band-aid off quickly in order to, you know, just get the thing done with. That was his problem. He could be very callous when he felt something was necessary to be done. That's not to say he was without sympathy or things like that. He said he regarded personal charity as a weakness, but essentially he viewed, you know, 
group charity or like societal charity as something that's valuable he spoke about like how the liberal class and hint hint there were a lot of people who disagreed with what he was doing with the jews even in germany how they like weep about basically what happens to the jews but they didn't care about the million or so the millions of germans who had to emigrate all the time because um they didn't you know have any living space left their quality of life was bad at in germany at home and he he kind of pointed out about german engineers being very important for the u.s um, and how like a million or I don't know a large number of people Germans died in the trip to Australia you know that was killing off people too I suspect he may be correct about that but that was probably more true in the beginning period of immigration than uh, the you know the time Hitler was talking about so kind of being a bit just ingenuous in my opinion Hitler had very little opinion of the United States and kind of almost often looked at things in a bit too optimistic of a light I feel uh, but Hitler's companions I, I think I'll say he, he what you have to understand with Hitler's violent takeover and a lot of his companions were former communists he had no desire to have any liberals in in his sense of the word liberals in his camp he viewed them as very weak-willed and too averse to violence and essentially useless so he went out of his way to avoid ever actually recruiting them um he actually did put things in place he methodically designed his the name of his party and all sorts of other stuff in order to avoid them he took the color red for nazism basically partially because of its uh, resemblance to the communist flag and all that he was very methodical and uh, almost clever about the way he went about everything he also evidently had his um foreign department later on you know his his ministers or his diplomatic staff he basically had them sleep with people in order to gain you know the the daughters of important people in order to gain information and influence um but basically he would have he, he did all these sorts of things which he cleverly outlines and if i had more time i'd tell you but basically he'd have his thugs target individual people you know at groups at group meetings or if at a, a dinner or whatever and have them one by one concentrate on harassing them because people didn't go and defend them so they'd get up and leave and then the next person would leave etc he had all sorts of clever tactics um that he used well a handful and they weren't very nice at all but that's kind of how he rose to power through using these various tactics it, it wasn't necessarily just through memorizing people magically you know mesmerizing them he also would send people because the socialists you know the communists had schools of oratory i guess you could call them and they train people to essentially propagandize for them if you want to phrase it that way uh he would send people um, kind of obviously to <laughs> this is an obvious idea but he'd send people to those courses so they'd know how they talked they know knew the lines they would give and they know when to shut them up you know or heckle them down or something like that they knew their opponent's playbook so that was clever they'd also uh, they also kind of compromised the police force as well by recruiting cops into their party so the cops would look the other way they'd incorporate you know once they saw that they were the stronger party a lot of communists joined them and they'd also employ women basically to go and uh beat up more or less their opponents so as my time is almost completely done owing to my battery i'm just going to wrap things up firstly i, I don't want to end on an inaccurate note um women were employed as distractions and yes sometimes physically uh to you know beat up people <laughs> at least to distract them they would put blame on falsely upon communists that happened to have been around in the area things like that women were actually employed by them cleverly although hitler kind of pointed out that again a lot of a lot of what he do he was doing he did it better but a lot of the things he complained about and hated that the socialists did they were highly aggressive and made fun of everyone kind of like modern politics um he ended up doing himself and he did better than they did so he kind of rose to power i just want to put in that nuance hitler did not uh, enter into a vacuum his political situation was kind of violent to begin with so that deserves mentioning he kind of did a lot of tactics that yes had been done before him that's important to note but also he had criticized so that's kind of hypocritical of him anyway 
uh, he had pointed out that the communists like or slash socialists would actually raise up their own children as shields against the cops or whoever happened to have been there after they had just moments earlier been throwing stones at these people when they you know cops actually closed in etc or people tried to defend themselves they take their own children which they had around and they use them as shields knowing probably that no one was going to attack them but hitler pointed out that this showed kind of the depraved nature of politics at the time and things like that and basically the marxist you know the, what sort of people they were so i'm just going to summarize with this i believe there's a strong argument to be made about the value of actually reading these documents because no Hitler is not a great guy but that said he's not the cartoonish depiction you know of like a completely insane lunatic which he is commonly made out to be and I understand people don't want to encourage certain political movements but honestly I think one of the best antidotes to anything is knowledge and I believe as people who are interested in truth and you know histo history and historical reality and also, in regards to learning from the past and predicting the future, it is very important we actually understand why and how things happened. Um, to summarize, Hitler could be a nice guy from time to time. He could be charitable. He made lots of jokes. I don't know if he's necessarily quite a comedian, but he did have a good sense of humor at times. He had people who liked him, and there were people who were very loyal to him and remained so, and some of it was actually earned. He's not perfect, and he should not be excused for what he did, of course, but we also should appreciate he was not an idiot, not in everything at least. He was a creative person in some things, and some of his ideas were practical. Um, I could list some of them, but I don't have time. He also did sometimes enter into some things with actually a good deal of consideration and reason. Um, However, his ultimate problem was that he was able to, like some other people who've done bad things, he was willing to sacrifice the individual, and that kind of explains why things happened the way they did, didn't it? Uh, he had some problems he was legitimately addressing, but he didn't do them, and very he didn't address them very well, and ultimately led to misery for his country. However, not everything he did without was without reason, like his invasion of Russia was more a preemption of an attack than anything else I think fairly we can say at this point so was Hitler a bad person in some things he was and in some things he wasn't I think at the very least I can respect him for his his dedication to his dog you know how much he loved his his dog and all that and um, you know how much he cared for his mother uh, his sub his views on marriage and things like that and why he didn't m marry Ava Braun until essentially he was almost dead can also be found in some of his writings and I hope you will go and look that up so there are a lot of interesting things you can ha find and questions will be answered if you actually read the man's words <laughs> or those of the people who are around uh, them so I hope you found this entertaining, interesting, and hopefully maybe a little relaxing. Forgive me for rushing through some parts of it. I have plenty of more I could say if you want to request another video. But for the moment, that's about it. And good night.